What's everybody's feeling? Perhaps a few minutes more. So I think I just start out and people will eventually drop by and probably that's again a very practical topic. I, am, uh, I was um, assigned for and when George gave me that again like intubation I was thinking of just sharing with you some observations because when you go to the literature uh, regarding techniques and procedures especially regarding lines and uh, treatment of complications in neonatology, you very rapidly find out that there's, again, very little evidence that uh, guides us. So if anybody wants to do uh, important research on that field, he'll be more than welcome to do that, either Melbourne or Munich or <laughs> Amsterdam, wherever. So. What I'd like to share with you a little bit for the last 45 minutes or so are some thoughts on lines, of course, and uh, in the last part of this talk, talk a little bit about how to manage air leaks and pitfalls in air leaks. Now let's start with lines, and I'd like to again start my talk with a poll. Um, who of you is using uh, umbilical lines in infants below 1,000 grams at birth routinely? Pretty much all of you, yes. Who is not using umbilical lines at all? Everybody does, good. And how about pick lines? Are you using pick lines? Pretty much most of you also do. So when we go to umbilical lines, this is the anatomy. I'm not going to uh, repeat that. You all know um, about the anatomy. Um, and the indication of applying umbilical lines are uh, straightforward. Uh, it's, it's named the preferred emergency access in the delivery room in infants that are severely compromised, but I'll come to that whether the evidence supports that or not. You can continuously measure central venous pressure there. Uh, you can even use the umbilical venous axis for exchange transfusion and for uh, concentrated parenteral nutrition. The umbilical arterial catheter helps you in um, drawing repeated blood gases, but my feeling is that if we have it in line, then we draw a lot of blood gases, so we might uh, consider that as well. And um, it helps you for the continuous blood pressure monitoring, diagnostic and, ge and geography, if you have problems there, and it might uh, even be used during resuscitation. Now, however, uh, umbilical lines also have contraindications, and this, again, is more common sense than evidence. Um, it's not suggested in infants with gastroenterological malformations with uh, apparent peritonitis or expected abdominal surgery. And the same is true for arterial catheters. In addition, there is also a, a problem if you have ischemia problems in the lower extremities, either uh, spontaneously or induced, and of course not in necrotizing enterocolitis. The techniques are also straightforward. You all know that. I'm not going to uh, elaborate on all that again. However, uh, a question rises whether or not you add heparin to a umbilical line at all. Who is adding routinely heparin to your infusion in central umbilical lines? Okay, who does not? Okay, so this is um, not uh, equal in all. If you go again to the uh, evidence-based data, uh, Keith Baring did a survey a couple of years ago and wasn't really uh, done uh, recently where uh, all studies were uh, evaluated who added one ml per, uh, one international unit of heparin per ml and it turned out that the odds ratio of 
complications regarding the occlusion of the line was reduced by 80%. So there is quite some evidence to use heparin um, if you consider all the potential uh, side effects of heparin. The placement, again, is um, suggested to be uh, for the umbilical venous line uh, straightforward with your normograms depending on birth weight. However, for the umbilical arterial line, there is a discussion also open whether or not you're choosing the high position of the arterial line versus the low position of the arterial line, being the lumbar um, uh, vertebra uh, 3 to 4 rather than the uh, first or the last uh, thoracic um, um, vertebral uh, I hate. So who is using umbilical artery line uh, at the high position? Some of you. Who is losing, using the low position? We do. Okay. So uh, this is also uh, open for discussion. However, um, there are, again, not a lot of uh, studies uh, addressing this issue. Can we dim the light a little bit, or is that a problem? Can we reduce the light a little bit? No? Okay, if not, then uh, you might. I, I'll just uh, guide you through that. Um, we have uh, different lines in this infant. There's a nasogastric tube. There's a central umbilical venous line. There's an arterial line. All of these lines are rather deep in there, and we... Uh, pull back all of these lines with the umbilical line in here and now uh, the umbilical arterial line down at uh, three to four uh, vertebra. Now when I looked through the literature regarding umbilical arterial line, there is a recent study that has investigated the impact of umbilical arterial uh, lines in an animal model. And this is a baboon model where um, they had either control animals in, a, uh, in the upper uh, aortic uh, region or the lower aortic region, and they compared the impact of six days or 14 days of umbilical line positioning in this baboon model. It's a preterm baboon model. And they were seeing about almost all of these animals developing some sort of thrombosis due to the arterial line. Um, in the abdominal aorta. And that makes you think uh, about using arterial lines too often uh, very much. Now, the complications of these lines, as you know, are predominantly infection thrombosis. Um, but uh, eventually, with an umbilical venous line, you may also observe perforations um, of the ductus venosus. And those complications might uh, only be obvious to you by an increasing um, circumference of the abdomen. And if you puncture this abdomen, you might, uh, retra, uh, uh, you might find their infusion uh, solution. Um, to decrease the incidence of complications, it's suggested that uh, after five to seven days, um, the umbilical venous catheter should be replaced by other axes. And pretty much the same um, is true for the umbilical arterial line um, with uh, the additional complication of impaired perfusion of the lower extremities. Now, when it comes to emergency access, it is quite interesting to um, look at other possibilities in the delivery room to apply um, medications there. And one of the other possibilities, of course, is the intraosseous needle. So who has an intraosseous needle available in the delivery room? Okay, we also do. And actually, the intraosseous <coughs> needle has been shown, and this is only one single uh, study that evaluated that, to be the fastest access depending on the experience of the uh, caretakers. Now, uh, in, our, uh, in newer times, there is this electric drill available, 
with the so-called easy intraosseous needle, the easy IO. And uh, in a recent study published in Pediatrics by Rajani and co-workers, they were looking into the uh, time, the average time to apply either uh, the umbilical venous catheter compared to the intraosseal needle. And it turned out that overall, in all studied medical professions, um, the intraosseous needle was about 40 to 50 seconds faster as compared to the umbilical line. However, in a well-trained neonatologist, there's not so much of a difference, um, especially if you do that very often. So I think that's quite interesting. And uh, especially if you have a pale asphyxiated infant, the intraosseous needle might be uh, the first line of uh, intervention if you need medication, especially if you need volume. You can apply pretty much all medications through the intraosseous needle, as you know, which is why um, this is also now one of the recommended routes for uh, resuscitation in the ILCO guidelines. Now it comes to peripheral venous axis. Um, this is daily business, so uh, you can um, get venous access pretty much everywhere in neonates. However, you have to take into consideration, especially in the lower extremities, if you are uh, using peripheral sur uh, surface vessels in these infants, the possibility of damaging um, venous valves is much higher and uh, may result in later term uh, venous problems in these infants. And that has been described. Nowadays we have uh, several devices to uh, use and in uh, Germany, I think it's, it's pretty much all over Europe, it's now suggested to have safety needles with these clips on the tip. There are other needles that have a small opening right after the tip of this needle that facilitates the um, application, especially in difficult venous axis, because you can immediately see that you enter the uh, venous cavity uh, with these uh, needles. And uh, I personally feel that these needles are not very easy to handle with, because once you retract your needle here, you cannot push it back in. So um, the techniques of uh, applying peripheral venous lines is also straightforward, and everybody of you knows how to do that. However, peripheral venous lines are also one of the most uh, important um, sites for nosocomial infections. So uh, I think it's quite important, especially for young residents, to be aware of this technique. And we usually... Um, start out with a cleaned um, skin, of course, with uh, gloves. And the most important thing, I think, uh, today is to have a transparent, sterile cover of the entrance of this venous line, um, which also is true for the arterial line or any other line, in order to be able to judge about this uh, venous axis throughout the time this axis is uh, in, in place, and also to cover it sterile. In former times, we used to uh, just cover it with a, re a regular tape, which is now no longer advised. So this is what we do. And the side effects also of peripheral lines, you have been there, are uh, especially nosocomial infections, thrombophlebitis, and paravasate skin necrosis, like you can see here. Now, uh, I'd like to just uh, spend a few words on pick lines. Pick lines are um, one of the most often used uh, venous axes in extremely preterm infants um, for total parenteral nutrition or uh, fluid administration. And uh, they are quite easy now to apply because you can uh, advance them through 24 gauge uh, needles and you can apply a maximum flow of up to uh, 0.7 ml per minute. Um, the maximum duration of these lines is uh, depending on the vendor and is up to 30 days, and the dead space is quite low. 
you can um, apply it pretty much everywhere and it's uh, always indicated for prolonged parenteral nutrition. Now there is a comparison um, of the peripheral venous catheter compared to the uh, PIC line with regard to um, the efficacy of parenteral nutrition and number of catheters needed as well as systemic infection that was uh, reviewed by Ainsworth in 2007 where they um, indicated that PIC lines are superior with regard to parenteral nutrition because um, they achieved much more often the prescribed amount of calories through the higher concentration of parenteral nutrition that can be given through a PIC line and the number of catheters needed was reduced with PIC lines of course as well. However, the number of systemic infections was not uh, different regarding peripheral venous catheters and PIC lines. So this is I think an interesting finding. I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Now, technique is, uh, again, something you need, but one of the important issues, I think, is the right placement of these pick lines. And now, if you look at that uh, x-ray here, I'd like to uh, ask you who thinks this pick line is in the right position. Um, you can see it coming from the right uh, arm, and it's bending over to the superior vena cava and uh, so who is thinking that's the right position? Okay, who thinks it's not? You think it's not, why? Why would you show us? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so one important thing is that if you apply a pick line through a peripheral superficial vein then you have to be aware that the position of the tip is very much dependent on the position of your arm. Now, um, if you look at the same baby, just moving the right arm a little bit, the tip of this catheter all of a sudden is down here, deep in the right atrium. So, why is that important? It is important from my point of view because we have uh, now followed up two infants who suffered from infuso, infuso pericardium. So infuso pericardium happens to occur if the tip of this pick line is deep in the right atrium and you are using a high uh, osmolarity parenteral nutrition. Um, this is not a perforation of the atrium, but it is most likely an osmotic trans, uh, trans wall uh, movement of fluid into the pericardium causing severe uh, compromising <laughs> of this infant. And the reason why this movement is taking place de or, or how it takes place very much depends on the superficial vein you're using because if you are um, introducing the pick line over the medial brachial vein, vein then this pick line will uh, enter the thoracical cavity through a medial way. As a result, you can see now I, I kind of painted out the humerus here with the elevated arm. If this elevated arm is um, brought down to the thorax, then this line will move into the superior vena cava because the line is medial, this hypermoclion, okay? On the other hand, if you're using the cephalic vein, then the uh, pick line will enter the thoracic cavity on the other side of the humerus. And now, if you elevate the arm, it's not going to be pulled out, but it's going to be pushed in. So, I think this is an important observation for your unit in order to define what's the correct position of your pick line. And in our unit we now have the policy to only do x-rays with the arms at the thoracic, uh, at the th thoracic wall because 
you've seen this movement of the uh, pick lines of up to two centimeters just by movement. So infuso pericard is the most deleterious um, side effect of using pick lines. And um, you have to be aware that that is a possible complication and you have to be aware how to treat that. Of course, pericardial synthesis is the way to go. But the most important side effect of uh, central lines in general are, of course, uh, infections. And uh, in Germany, all neonatal units are obliged to, um, to put their infectious data into a, a nationwide database called uh, German Neokiss Surveillance. So it's the uh, nosocomial infections in neonatology. And we uh, also put in uh, our data there on an annual basis. And this is a recent <coughs> uh, evaluation of these data with regard to most large neonatal centers in Germany. And it turned out that the nosocomial bloodstream infection with peripheral and central venous lines in neonates increases the uh, hazard ratio six times above those infants who are not dependent on any venous access. So again, to uh, really observe hygiene, to observe the sterile application, not only for the, uh, uh, introducing this peripheral and central venous lines, is mandatory to prevent nosocomial bloodstream infections, but also the handling of all connectors especially the uh, connectors with large dead space volumes are prone to be um, the reason for bloodstream infections. So um, we have also standard operating procedure uh, guidelines for both um, physicians and nurses in order to um, reduce nosocomial infections due to indwelling catheters. Now, I'd like to uh, now continue with arterial lines. Arterial lines, if not umbilical lines, are usually peripheral arterial lines that are indicated in infants that are quite instable, where you need to have continuous blood uh, pressure monitoring. And the uh, preferred sites to apply these uh, catheters are the radial artery and the ulnar artery. And um, in order to use that, you know that you need to always do the Allen test. And nowadays that we have the trans-illuminating uh, devices where you can actually see these vessels, um, it's much easier to judge whether or not you have uh, uh, enough uh, perfusion there. Uh, very um, educational video can be seen on the website of the New England Journal of Medicine where uh, the application of um, peripheral arterial lines is illustrated. This is the uh, setup for our uh, unit. It's always sterile and we um, just do it like in the operation room. This is the trans illumination and um, basically it's uh, the same as putting in a pick line and again, the most important thing from my point of view is the sterile, transparent coverage of this, um, um, of this arterial line. Okay. Complications of arterial lines are sometimes very subtle to de detect. This is uh, uh, the forefoot of a uh, previous 26-weeker that developed necrotizing enterocolitis and went to the OR um, for his abdominal uh, operation with an arterial line in the posterior tibial artery um, to monitor uh, blood pressure during operation. This arterial line um, went well and functioned uh, quite nicely throughout the operation, but when the baby went, came back from the OR, uh, there was only a very subtle um, uh, color change in the forefoot here. And uh, in the 
following days, a severe um, arterial obstruction developed, with, which finally resulted in the loss of the uh, total foot with uh, a long-term decrease of the affected um, uh, bone size and a severely handicapped infant. Now, before I continue, I'd like to ask you, are there any comments, discussions, or questions regarding lines before we continue from here? This is more a slideshow with pictures, so uh, not, not a lot to discuss. So I'd like to continue with a case. Oh, yeah. Yes, please. The approach to treat arterial line thrombosis? Um, that's a very difficult question, and I actually cannot answer. If it is a, a vital situation where you have, um, um, where you're afraid to lose a limb like that, for example, um, we would um, have a trial of thrombolytic uh, lytic, uh, therapy although there is no evidence showing any benefit from doing that. So we would try to apply RTPR, uh, RTPA and, um, of course, heparinization. But this infant received a lot of uh, recombinant uh, uh, RTPA, and um, this did not solve the problem at all. So... Any other comments on, on thrombolysis in neonates? This, is, this has been very uh, popular a popular couple of years ago with both central venous thrombosis as well as renal thrombosis. Um, and no um, randomized trials were ever done in neonates. And that's all data are coming from observational studies. And uh, retrospective analysis of most of these thrombolytic therapies turned out to have no beneficial effect whatsoever, neither in central venous cath uh, thrombosis nor in peripheral arterial thrombosis. What would you do, Peter and Anton? Would you treat thrombolytic, yes. thrombolytic? Well, the baby with venous thrombosis, only if it's in the heart, then it is. Mm. So superior vena cava total thrombosis is very, has a very poor prognosis, and most of the infants I've seen did very badly. Yes, Intracardial th thrombus, that's a different story, right. Yeah, how about you, Peter? It's very rare. It's very rare, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's very rare. All right, now I'd like to continue with some cases, okay? Clinical cases, uh, everyday cases, this is a 31-weeker, um, actually doing pretty well after delivery, uh, 1,350 gram. The respiratory rate is 80 per minute, needs a little bit of oxygen, but gas exchange is actually doing pretty well, achieving a PCO2 of 49 and a PO2 of 46. What do you say? What do you do? Would you do an X-ray on that baby? Who would do, who would do, a, do an X-ray? It's, it's coming right from the delivery room. No X-ray? No, nobody's going to do an X-ray? You will? Okay, thank you. We would. <laughs> it's, it's using oxygen, so I don't know. Okay, so we did, unfortunately. Turned out like that. What do you think? <laughs> That's why we did the X-ray, right? So what do you think is that? What's that? So uh, one suggestion is lung collapse of the left side. Okay, who is agreeing? Who, who, who thinks there's a lung collapse? Okay. Yeah, can we dim the light a little bit? Can we dim the light? No? There, there should be a switch up there somewhere. No, no switch? <laughs> Too bad. Oh, never mind. We just continue, okay? So, on the one hand, there was the differential uh, diagnosis to have a pneumothorax on the left side. However, if you really look at it very thoroughly, um, there's no sign of tension, tension pneumothorax. 
And actually, this is a typical sign of pneumomediastinum, because what you see up here is the thymal gland, okay? That's the thymus. This is a pneumomediastinum. However, there's a, and you can barely see it on this x-ray, especially because you can't dim the light, you can see a line down here. So this infant also had a tiny uh, pneumothorax on the left side. So this was drained. However, as you can see, drainage did not solve this problem up here, which was the typical pneumomediastinum. So we are talking about pneumothoraces now. And um, so, again, there are not a lot of good data suggesting uh, what to do if you have a pneumothorax in an infant, um, whether or not to treat it. And that's uh, most likely a clinical decision. However, it usually starts out, sorry for this blown out picture, but uh, the most important thing here probably is possible to be seen from up there as well. It's a 26 week of gestational twin uh, infant. It's the first day of life. It had a severe uh, amniotic infection syndrome, RDS, one time surfactant, and it was ventilated with uh, quite high uh, peak inspiratory pressure and an FiO2 of 70. Anton would say put it on an oscillator and increase the uh, lung volume, of course. However, if you look at it very closely, you can already see uh, tiny bubbles along the bronchial um, areas, which is an indicator for um, extra bronchial air. So air leak usually um, happens in up to 2% of term neonates, and of course is much more common in infants with uh, transient tachypnea of newborn or respiratory distress syndrome, and in general it starts with a rupture of the alveolar septi in the small airways. And then air is trapped in the interstitial tissue and slowly uh, moving towards the peripheral area of the lung, resulting in the pulmonary interstitial emphysema. So if the visceral pleura ruptures, then it leads to pneumothorax. However, it can also lead to other accumulations of air, as we have seen in the mediastinum, in the pericard, or in the pulmonary ligament. Who knows what the pulmonary ligament is? Are you aware of the pulmonary ligament? Who is? Not really. Oh, interesting. So pulmonary ligament actually dates back into your early pre-medical training into anatomy. Pulmonary ligament is nothing else but a fold of visceral to, um, to uh, mediastin uh, mediastinal pleura, where actually these two uh, layers of uh, pleura are folded together at the mediastinal uh, facing um, side of the lung. And if you have an infant that has a pneumothorax at the mediastinal area with air in the ligamentum pulmonale, you will most likely not be able to drain this air with a uh, pleural uh, catheter. Now, the diagnosis is made clinically together with transillumination and, of course, x-ray. This is the typical sign of pneumothorax on the left side, here in contrast on the, light, uh, on the right side of the same infant. And uh, if there is compromised uh, cardiac output, then, of course, the indication of um, emergency puncture at the second to third intercostal space at the medial clavicular uh, line and continuous drainage is indicated. Now, again, this is a very poor old picture, but I'd like to share it with you because it shows you some interesting uh, issues as well. This is an infant at the second day of life, developed uh, pneumothorax on the right side. You can see there is tension pneumothorax because there's a shift of the heart towards the right side. It had before a pneumothorax on the right side, and there is a drain on the <coughs> uh, in the re left chest, um, probably not draining sufficiently. 
Okay, are you agreeing with that? Okay, so um, there is also some additional air in this infant at the diaphragmatic side of the lung, and we call that subpleural air. And again, this is very difficult to drain because this air is trapped at the visceral pleura of the left lung here and is not something that is communicating with the uh, space around the lung um, all over the whole uh, area of the thorax. Now, uh, this child got another um, drain now advancing from uh, the top of the uh, the, the top of the left hemithorax, and do you think now this is well drained? Who would vote for a sufficient drainage of this um, pleural drain? As far as you can see here, okay. So the problem with pleural drains, from my point of view, always is if you only rely on one. Uh, plane. You should, um, if you're not sure about the right position of your pleural drain, you should always consider a lateral view. And a lateral uh, x-ray showed the two different drains here, which are either coming from here, here's the head from this lateral view, and the other one coming um, from here. So now the question is, is this drain in the right position or not? Who would still vote for the right position of this drain? Who's thinking that's in the right position? What do you think? This one mm -hmm. is inserted very high here at the second intercostal space. It's very high, that's true. So this was a child that was transferred to us um, with the diagnosis of recurrent pneumothoraces, and uh, the question was, what are you going to do with that child? At that time, uh, was pretty much stable on uh, the ventilator setting, still using a lot of oxygen. But if you look at this drain here, which is coming from uh, the upper part of the thorax, going on this plane, on the anterior-posterior plane, of the x-ray right into the lung. And the same is true on the lateral view. So this strain is stuck in the lung, parenchyma, okay? So and only on the lateral view you are able to really distinguish where your drain is actually located. So you have to take into consideration that even if the child, if the tension pneumothorax looks like improving that might have taken place while you're doing this puncturing, and still your drainage is not in the right position. So in our unit, it's a policy to actually always have a lateral view, if, even if the drain is supposedly in the right position. Now, how to put a pleural drain, all of you know, so I'm not going to uh, discuss that uh, extensively. This is the emergency um, axis, and then... Uh, <coughs> Now the head is down here. This is the old way of uh, putting in a pleural drain with, a, um, uh, with spreading the intercostal space. And then this is the tube in place. And uh, this has been the x-ray prior to the puncture here. Nowadays, we tend to use uh, pigtail catheters. Who is using pigtail catheters in the unit now? Okay, so what's your experience? You like that or you think it's, it's very easy to apply, isn't it? You just put it in there, it's, it has a sharp needle. And usually you're quite confident that a pigtail, um, after draining the pneumothorax here, is in the right position. Now again, this is a clinical picture of an infant um, that had a pneumothorax before. And again, the question is who thinks that's in the right position? You don't like it, Peter? What are you, what are you gonna do? <laughs> that's real good. Who is thinking that's the right position for the pigtail? 
N nobody is? Okay, good. So we, we were also not confident, so what we did is, first of all, pull back this catheter a little bit uh, in the first place, and it turned out like that. And this absolutely is an indication uh, if your pigtail is kind of unwinding after pulling it back a little bit, you must be very suspicious um, that this pigtail is not in the right position. And again, on the lateral view, if now you combine these two um, pictures, it's quite obvious that this pigtail catheter again is in the pulmonary parenchyma. And um, this baby actually got much better after pulling all of these catheters. There is some air still in the mediastinal face of this lung. As you can see here, there's also quite some shade around there, but this infant didn't need any further drainage at all. Now, malposition of pigtails has been described also in literature um, a couple of years ago by Brooker and co-workers. And again, in this infant, you would suggest, well, it might be uh, quite nicely uh, at the thoracic wall. However, this infant died um, after a while. And when they looked into the post-mortem, you could easily see the lung perforated by this pigtail catheter um, positioning. So although they are very easy to uh, apply as pleural drains, you have to be aware that uh, pigtail catheters might as well as the old trocar-driven uh, pleural drains might um, be placed within the lung parenchyma. So in order to rule out misplacement, um, always consider lateral view because laceration of the visceral pleura of vessels or even the thora thoracic duct might take place in a malpositioning of these drains. And that's pretty much what I'd like to share with you with regard to procedures and techniques. Any questions? Yes. Just, uh, I was asked to uh, kind of um, ask people to wait until the microphone comes because a lot of others can't, couldn't understand uh, okay. the question. Yeah. Thank you. What do you think about ultrasound as a technique for detection of ear leak syndromes? Of ear leak syndromes? Ear leak syndromes or yeah. another pathology in the lungs of the newborns. So lungs I'm, ultrasound. Okay. So um, lung ultrasound, of course, is difficult. Um, it is a very good tool if you have pleural effusion. It has also been shown to be a sufficient tool to detect uh, endotracheal tube position, actually. Um, and I have no experience with regard to uh, air leak um, as a diagnostic tool. It might be used. I, I'm not aware of any studies there. Mm -hmm. uh, in our department, we use this technique for detection of all type of ELIC syndromes mm -hmm. and also for respiratory distress syndrome. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can use it also for detection of the fluid in yes, pleural cavities. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so that's very interesting. So you should, you should um, try to look at the validity of your ultrasound as, regard, uh, as compared to either transillumination and or x-ray. Yeah? Yes, please. One, one minute, one minute. When talking about umbilical venous catheters, everybody or always says, and then you place it. And I think we, most of us will agree that the really difficult thing is not to get it stuck in the liver. Right. And most of us will know so a trick that we're really happy that when, when it occasionally works, that pressing on the liver mm -hmm. uh, uh, can get, uh, can make you come through the liver. Can, can open up the ductus venosus. Yes. yes, or is, are you or anyone else aware of techniques that can increase the success of, um, so of <laughs> umbilical venous catheter placement? Um, that's, uh, that's a very interesting question. There is one study uh, looking into the success rate of umbilical uh, venous catheters in, in one unit. I think it was in France where they uh, had a success rate between 50 and 70 percent. Um, there are some tricks aside from uh, compressing the liver uh, using just a second catheter 
in parallel with the one uh, that is malpositioned because you usually feel it quite well then uh, that just move another one uh, alongside this one in place that sometimes works because you're kind of uh, occluding the false way already but then you have to have quite a large lumen of a, a umbilical vein a vein another one yeah other suggestions i don't know if the uvc uh, cannot be advanced into central position uh, in a, a small baby what would you do if it cannot be advanced into the central position and you have a resuscitation situation um, you can you can use the uh, umbilical venous line for fluids and uh, medications if it's only uh, pushed in very uh, shortly but then you have to change to any other line like a pick line or something later on in the unit I mean you try the next day or leave it for three or five days I would not leave it for three or five days but so the next the next day or the same same day okay thank you yeah. but this is not evidence-based this is experience whatever <laughs> other questions can we use uh, umbilical artery line for other purposes than just for monitoring can we it has been used for also uh, infusion therapy um, if you are not able to get venous access um, at some points it, people even used it for exchange transfusion but I'd be very careful to, to suggest that um, Hmm. The biotics and some drugs, medicines? I, I, I have no suggestions in that. Um, it might be a possibility, but you have to take into consideration that a lot of uh, drugs are hyperosmotic and uh, might induce um, arterial spasm. So I'd be very careful. Hmm. So did, did they ever evaluate that? It worked well? Good. Yeah. If you're stuck, it's absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, um, I was just saying that uh, the umbilical arterial catheter is a, is a very useful um, vac vascular access. If you need it, I've been very comfortable in the past to use it to give antibiotics and, and intravenous infusions or 10% uh, dextrose maintenance fluid, and you can use that for several days. Uh, uh, inotropes, not so much. Not but so much. Uh, yeah. yeah, but but that's with the tip in the high position. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that might be also a difference. Um, if you have a low position, then the dilution of your medication is a little less probably there was one more question up there <clears throat> are there any data how long you would leave an intraosseous line um, the intraosseous line has been uh, suggested to be um, also available for a couple of days um, and the, the rate of osteomyelitis is not increased um, by then. But I think it's not much more than with the umbilical lines. Okay, so yes, one more question. Uh, using an uh, intraosseous line on newborns, you don't experience many per, uh, perforations through tibia. Well, we are not using it a lot, but in the delivery room during resuscitation, if an umbilical line is not available immediately, then we would use it. And um, I never experienced any uh, tibial fracture or something like that. But it's a, it's a rare occasion, of course. Yeah. Who is responsible for uh, performing central lines? Physicians or nurses? Who can do Physicians. That? In our unit, only physicians. Do you have any knowledge about that in some 
some other units it's uh, also possible for nurses? Well, uh, the one study I've showed you um, where they looked into the uh, time frame of putting in lines, uh, that also included uh, physician assistants, and uh, they were doing very well there. And I think in your unit, a lot of physician assistants or nurses put in the lines very rapidly because they're very experienced, of course. Yeah. Uh, I've got one more question. Yes. We all know that the pick lines have uh, like sizes and uh, there's 12 centimeters, 20 centimeters. What do you do if the pick line is too long? Do you um, cut it or do you just no, drag it out? There, from my, uh, to my knowledge, there's only one vendor that uh, offers you the possibility to actually cut the pick line. Uh, this is the old Vigon uh, catheter with the metal uh, splint in there. This one you can cut. All the others are glued together. You can't cut. Um, you could cut beforehand. Uh, we never do that. We have either 20 centimeters or 30 centimeters. And for a small baby, we would go for a 20 centimeter. Um, You're not afraid of blood clotting at the end of the tip when you cut it, because uh, it's well, not it's not plain anymore. It's uh, no. When you the the one you could cut the vegan with the splint, um, we don't have it anymore. But when we use that, we uh, cut it only outside of the patient, not the tip. Okay, so where the splint is connected to the pick line, right? Yeah. So this is not affecting the tip at all. I, I would be very careful to cut the tip. Okay. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much.